Hey, what's up, folks? Uh, welcome back to another edition of the Winning Drive here on On Texas Football. Happy Eclipse Day to everybody out there. I'm Lifetime Longhorn Rod Davis, joined by Lifetime Longhorn C.J. Vogel. Uh, he's the real MVP, man. He's the man in the know. Uh, Coach Bob Shipley will not be joining us today. He's got some uh, other stuff going on, some conflicts, but everything's okay. He's good. He's going to be back. He actually, so don't be thinking something happened with the Eclipse uh, and Coach Shipley was raptured or something like that. Now it's all good. All right. Uh, so, hey, uh, CJ, how you doing, man? Uh, how's everything? Did you observe the eclipse? Let's just get that out the way because that's the big story of the day, actually. The big story is the eclipse. How, what were your thoughts of it? Did you observe it? You know, what were did you go to an eclipse party? What was going on? Yeah, I mean, it's hard not to want to see what's going on. You know, it was a pretty neat deal. Uh, we went up to the roof of our apartment, you know, kind of on the on the uh, the parking garage area, there was a lot of people up there. I'm sure there wasn't many people getting anything done this afternoon by the time that eclipse started rolling through Austin. But no, that was pretty sweet. It got it got really dark. I mean, it did what it was supposed to do. That eclipse was as as advertised. I liked it. It was cool. I'm not going. I'm with you. It did not let down. It was not a letdown. Like it was not a disappointment. When it got dark, it was like holy Chicago. It's like nighttime. I did like all the lights came on, like all of our all of my lights that are nighttime lights. Boom, they yeah. came on. Pop on. Yeah, like it was. Yeah, it was no doubt. It was creepy, and it was it was creepy and cool at the same time. And so I live I, I live right by school. Basically, half the damn school decided to stay at home. So parents were staying at home with the kids, and even the kids that went to school. I was told by the crossing guard that the parents. They came to school to watch the eclipse with the kids. So it took like a half a day. I had to take my dog to the vet. I took my dog to the vet. I went to the vet at like, it was like 2, probably 2.30 was the appointment. Dude, the vet's office was closed. No joke, no BS. On the window, it said, close for the eclipse. And I'm like, man, the eclipse is big time. It's, it, it's taking, it took everything over for a while. Time just stopped for the eclipse, man. So. No, truly. Yeah, I mean, I'm telling you, I don't think many people were doing anything for this afternoon. <laughs> If there's a way to put your little Slack notifications on do not disturb parentheses eclipse, I'm sure people would have done it. Uh, that little green light would have been a, a, a little black dot for the for the eclipse there. That was really cool, though. Yeah, man, I'm with you. Though. I, I didn't think it'd be that cool, but me and wife were outside. I was actually cleaning the grill. I was like, man, this ain't going to be no big deal. I was cleaning the grill, doing my thing, and then, boom, I was uh, taken aback by the, uh, the, the, the the eclipse, the astronomical event. Um, so appreciate all you guys joining us. All right. Oh, Bryce, hook him from the final four. Hey, all hey, right. there you go. hey, there you go. That's legit. That's legit. Um, all right. Now, this is something we'll get into a lot of questions and everything you got. You got super chats. Just throw them out there. Of course, those always come to the front of the line. So we appreciate all the love uh, that you guys uh, give us all the time. But we'll start off with the recruiting nuggets because we know there's a lot going on in recruiting. Um, my man, CJ, I'll, I'll keep you in the know there. He'll get you everything you need to know on the recruiting breakdown. Also, we got to talk about the scrimmage over the weekend. Big scrimmage for Texas football. Um, so there was some uh, some some performances that we got to talk about. Uh, there are some guys who may have separated themselves in that scrimmage. So we'll give you all that we know about the scrimmage, all that's out there. We'll get into that coming up in the show a little bit also the Tavondre sweat news unfortunately we'll talk about it there's buzz already that it will affect his draft stock so we'll talk about that a little bit and how much it will affect a man Tavondre sweat's draft stock we'll get into that uh and Paul Feinbaum I I think he's trolling a little bit but Paul Feinbaum had something to say about the Texas Texas and m rivalry so we'll get into that uh we can't wait it's going to be rekindled this year I'm old school when I played we played the Aggies all the time so it was fun playing the Aggies but I know a lot there's a generation by CJ I mean generation of Longhorn fans that don't really know much about Texas Texas and m right did you were you a kind of, how old were you when the when the rivalry stopped Oh, 15, maybe 15. Yes, you know, yeah, you, you, okay, you experienced it then. Okay. Listen, I, I got, I understood it. I saw the hatred. I, I knew oh, that yeah. you didn't like talking to your AM family members on Thanksgiving. I, I understood it, <laughs> but I didn't get to watch a lot of it, especially around that time. You know, we, we were in a Cowboys household. So, yeah, we had the game on, but that was always the secondary uh, game, at least. You know, my mom was the Cowboys fan in the house. So, uh, shout out to her, but we 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 made sure to watch that game and just the hatred. I I I'm eager to see that back moving from Twitter Spaces, you know, social media, online, all the back and forth over the last decade plus. To all right, now we get to see the action on the field. I want to see you know just 
how elevated the the bragging rights get when that game eventually comes back. Yeah, I'm with you on that too. I do. I mean, I think this season it may have a little bit more cachet than normal because it's re, the first rekindling of the rivalry for a long time. But yeah, can it? Does it have staying power to actually be a relevant rivalry? I think that'll depend on how relevant the Aggies are, pretty much. Uh, we'll get into that coming up a little bit later on in the show. Yes. We won't talk too much Aggies because I know that annoys people, but we'll get into it just a little bit. Uh, all right. <laughs> uh, let's start, uh, CJ, with recruiting nuggets. I know people want to get to the recruiting breakdown because there was a lot of recruiting news over the weekend. Um, so what do you what do you got for the people? Yeah, I thought Texas did a really fine job you know, making an impression on guys that they needed to make an impression on, whether it be a Jamie French coming in, uh, DeCorian Moore stayed the night, came back Sunday after or Sunday morning, uh, uh, Jonah Williams, Elijah Barnes, Zion Williams, a number of guys that Texas has atop of their board right now that really left in high regards for what they saw at the scrimmage, their position coaches in action, uh, the meetings beforehand, and also meeting with Sarkeesian. And, and hey, Rod, I, I know – when you were going on recruiting visits, I'm sure they didn't have all the uh, the hoopla, everything around the uh, the stadium. But when you have the Country Music Awards across the street at Moody Center getting set up and yeah. you got four food trucks out there at Moncrief, the day's loaded with stuff to do. So uh, Texas really put on a good show in my eyes. Obviously got a commitment out of it. Ricky Stewart, the running back out of Chapel Hill. Yep. How about this? 2,800 yards a year ago in 40 touchdowns. He averaged more than a first down per carry last year at Chapel Hill. That doesn't scream production. I don't know what does. Really talented prospect. Uh, really a nice addition to this class for the Longhorns and one that to shard choice, you know, didn't have to go too far to go get. So uh, hot start there. I wanted to talk about Jamie French as well. Uh, the wide receiver out of Manor in Florida now has Texas in his top three. He told me afterward, I probably Texas was not in that top three coming into the weekend. Certainly noteworthy. Texas able to get him on campus to, uh, over the weekend. They locked in an official visit for June 21st through 23rd. And also now it's going to be a three-team race, it seems, with Tennessee and Ohio State. Uh, he does have officials locked in to Miami for June 1st and Tennessee June 14th through 16th. Right now, a little interesting, not uh, that Ohio State does not have uh, an official visit locked in at the moment. But regardless, uh, another big visitor I've yet to catch up with 100%, but Dorian Brew made it to campus, Texas. Uh, it was kind of on the fence whether or not he would make it to campus or not. Right now you're kind of getting an idea of the Texas defensive back class kind of shaping up a little bit. I thought Texas really rolled out the red carpet for in, uh, Aiden Anding. Graham fan Madden down in the comments today, you know, listen, I'm going to beat that drum because Texas rolled out the red carpet. He did not step foot on campus anywhere. He was rolling around on the golf cart uh, with, you know, staff members uh, with his family. They went to go check out the academic uh, side of things as well with a, a meeting with advisors. So uh, Aiden Anding, uh, Dorian Brew on campus, Cade Phillips, another one. And now Texas has uh, Caleb Chester coming in this weekend as well. So it, it's kind of getting an idea of what that defensive back group might look like uh, in the 2025 class. Certainly we'll see who else is able to schedule official visits moving forward. Aiden Anding, another guy that is uh, scheduled to come in June 21st through 23rd. One last guy I wanted to mention. It, it sounds like Texas is making a very, very strong push and is probably the team to beat for Elijah Barnes. He left the facility with a little notebook that he said uh, Coach Nansen gave him uh, that went over schemes, uh, formations, play calls, Rod, you don't do that if you're not if you're not a top of the board for the Texas Longhorns. And knowing just how involved Texas has been with Barnes in his recruitment, to me, kind of gives you an understanding of where things sit between the Dallas Skyline product and the Longhorns. Again, it sounds like Coach Nansen really did a, a fine job making a first impression uh, back on campus because he has seen him in person a few times. But now he's got the idea of what it's like to see him coach these guys in person, as well as, you know, just getting an idea of what the scrimmage was like as well. Um, who would you say in that 2025 class, your opinion, that the Longhorns got to get? Got to have this guy. Got to have Listen, him. It, There's a couple. There, there's a couple. The, the, the first one, and I'm sure most people in the comments will – We'll, we'll agree with me here. It's the Corian Moore. I mean, it's a guy with a 10-4 speed. I talked to him afterward. Uh, he said he wants to get down to the, the high 10 twos. I mean, that alone what? is incredible. 
<laughs> he, if you even think like it's, it's, it's the same thing with Xavier Worthy when he ran the four two five, the fact that he went back to try to run again means that he's run faster than that before to believe. Oh no, I can run a four. I can break the record. Same exactly. Thing he if he believes he can run a ten two, that means he's he's run something faster than what is his clock speed? You say ten four? Yeah. 10-4 flat, fat time. So it, it's not like he's too far off. But, again, you know, if you're going to scratch off a whole tenth of a second, <laughs> you've got to have an extra gear to do that. So uh, I'll yeah. be interested to see that. Maybe he just needs that adrenaline pumping again yeah. in the state meet because I do believe he will end up in the state finals uh, here in Austin later on this year. Uh, because when you saw him run that 10-4, and Jerry Hamilton posted that clip on Twitter earlier uh, this spring, when you're beating guys by 15, 20 feet, I mean, yeah, you can kind of coast that last, you know, 10 yeah. meters or so. You, you've got it in the bag. So maybe that's just what he needs, kind of being pushed a little bit. He also had great comments about seeing practice, seeing Coach Jackson in action, watching that wide receiving group uh, go through their drills. He singled out Ryan Wingo, also mentioned Isaiah Bond as someone that he was mentioned, uh, keeping a close eye on. So Texas made a strong impression with him. Uh Getting him back, I, he will be back on campus June 21st through 23rd for his official visit. Uh, that's where we believe he will be, be coming in. That's going to be big for him. We don't expect right now to be any movement in that recruitment one way or the other uh, for his recruitment uh, until the June officials. That's when you'll start seeing anything happen. If anything happens right now, I think Texas is making a lot of noise, getting him to campus for back-to-back -back weekends. He obviously had the Texas relays a week ago, but just being around the facility, seeing what's going on in Austin, obviously seeing, uh, you know, the, the campus, the practice, and, and Coach Sarkeesian and Jackson, it, it's going to go a long way in that, in that recruitment. Yeah, uh, no doubt. Obviously, the recruits, uh, they were impressed with what they saw at the scrimmage because, uh, like you said, you even had a recruit that committed on the spot to my man Jerry Hamilton. Shout out to Jerry because um, uh, I always give him props for, for discovering Rod B or at least giving me my first uh, ranking of any kind in the recruiting realm. Jaden Blue is the name that got dropped uh, the most among all the reports from the, the reports that you guys were mentioning here at Owen Texas Football, um, other reports out there uh, that Jaden Blue really stepped up. And what you've noticed about Jaden Blue's game is not only a guy that can hurt you with the speed to the outside now, um, from what I've been hearing and from what is being reported, he's also a guy now that looks like he's improved his vision and footwork and now can be a guy that can hurt you with some of those interior runs as well whether it be the inside zone, uh, whether it be some some uh, more gap schemes, that he's uh, really diversifying his game and his running style, not just the one-trick pony of the guy that can be a, a threat in the passing game and a threat on the edge. Uh, that's the case, and you have two of those guys, and, and, and Cedric Baxter obviously brings his own unique element to the run game too. I just can't help but think, man, what this running back room could be if Sark – decides to use a lot of the pieces like he has done recently with when he had Keelan Robinson and Rojo and he had Bijan and he threw all those guys out there and used them all. Um, and we've been hearing about Trey Wisner, uh, but give me your thoughts on Jaden blue. Cause Jaden blue had basically increased his, um, his usage or his target share or his uh, rate of, you know, the runs that he's going to get potentially with this offense with what he's showing. Yeah, I think so. And I think a lot of that, I was told right after the scrimmage, yes, he had a great day. He had a touchdown in which uh, he kind of bowled over David Benda and even brought Derek Williams with him fighting towards the corner. So to do that with those two guys at that size gives you an indication of the increase in uh, physicality, I would say, from Jaden Blue, who not necessarily not isn't known as a, uh, a, a between the tackles guy. That's not been his game. You get him out in space, you let him work there. And good things happen. We know that to be the case. He's one of the fastest players with the ball in his hands from a year ago. Uh, Racing Guillory, who we had on uh, the Longhorn live stream last night, actually mentioned it uh, on the on campus as well. He's like, yeah, I, I watched Jaden Blue because I've been compared to him. We have similar play styles. We're not the biggest backs, but with the ball in our hands, we're that close away from taking it the distance at any moment. Uh, he mentioned right away, he was like, yeah, I loved what I saw from him. Anytime you get the ball in his hands in space, Good things seem to happen. So great day from Jaden Blue. Uh, we heard positive things about Trey Wisner, which it feels like every time that we're up by the facility, whether it be Coach Sarkeesian, uh, some of the players on the team, or just 
recruits, coaches, and family members in attendance. They're singling out Trey Wisner one way or the other. That was another name that was picked up on. Hey, Rod, I couldn't tell you how many times uh, we heard about Ryan Wingo as well. Uh, to pivot over to the wide receiver from St. Louis that's making his first impression on campus. You talk to any wide receiver prospect that was on campus this weekend, Ryan Wingo was a name that they were singling out, saying, yeah, we knew he was good. But I didn't know he, that's what he had in store. Like, that was very impressive. Jamie French, you know, he the, the wide receiver out of Mandarin, he he uh, really had great things to say about Ryan Wingo. I, verbatim saying, I, I, I've, I've known about him. I've watched him, got to see him again. And my goodness, that was uh, impressive stuff. So Ryan Wingo making noise, uh, one of the big freshmen that we expect to see on the field this fall as well. Yeah, I'm with you. I, I I said it when I watched film on him. I still got my notes initially uh, from about Ryan Wingo, and it's just going to be hard to keep that guy off the field. Uh, it really is going to be – and he's one of the reasons, along with DeAndre Moore and along with, you know, all the guys coming in, Matthew Golden and obviously Isaiah Bond. You know, we forget about Jonte Cook, who's also right. – uh, heard, heard made some plays too. We can get into that. But, man, I, I just think you're going to see Sark expand that group for the first time, the circle of trust for the first time. And, yeah, I agree with you, Ryan. And we'll see Ryan Wingo, all SEC freshman team. How are these targets going to divide up? I, I cannot wait to hear. I saw a little a stat, actually, about this. Uh, I got friends who are kind of college college football fantasy guys um, doing a lot of research in fantasy, and, and thank God they do because it gives you a great idea, kind of a really cool idea exactly how – um, Sark in the last few years has divided up his target share. And Xavier Worthy was, I think his freshman year, he was like over 30. He was like 31%, something like that. It was something crazy and freaky. And he's been over 25%, or at least he was over 25% every year that he was at Texas. Um, so as the number one wide receiver, the average for Sark in the last 10 years is around 27% target share for his number one wide receiver. And I, this year, we assume it's going to be Isaiah Bond. We don't know. It could be Jonte Cook. I mean, I, we don't actually know which one of those guys. It could be Bond. It could be Jonte Cook. I think this year you might see that target share drop for the number one wide receiver. You'll still be able to clearly know who's the number one guy, but there just might be more diversification of the target share because you have so many weapons. And I do think, or at least early on, before he and Sark, I think at one point he is going to shrink the rotation. But early on in the season, and I guess you can't do it too early because you still got Michigan. So, I mean, that's early. I think early on, while he's still figuring out exact tinkering things a little bit with the offense, you may see a larger uh, rotation of guys. And then maybe by midseason, that rotation is down to four, maybe five guys. If Ryan Wingo forces his hand or yeah. you know, DeAndre Moore forces his hand. Um, but I, I, right now I'm looking at, I think five guys right now, early on, you're going to see in regular rotation out there. Yeah, I do too. Cause I, it, it's interesting with Quinn Ewers. We know that he's a talented quarterback, the, but what we do know is Sarkeesian loves to balance out his down the field attack with that running game. And so you're not going to see Quinn hucking the ball 500 plus times uh, in a season. So where do the rest of those targets go? You know, you're probably going to be in the high 300s, the low 400s, if I had to guess at the moment. Uh, are those, are there going to be 100 targets for one guy in that group? Maybe not. We know Xavier Worthy squeaked over that mark again this past season for the third consecutive year, but it's a little different when you compare what Sarkeesian's done at Texas with his number one quote-unquote wide receiver than what we expect to see at this point moving in 2024. You know, Texas needed Xavier Worthy and threw him the ball so often because there really wasn't anywhere else to go with the ball consistently. Yeah, you had some solid pieces, but no one to the level of Xavier Worthy that was healthy at the time that can continue to get, you know, uh, that that you know, kind of experience and production on the field that you needed. You know, there wasn't that 1B to his 1A. When Xavier or when A.D. Mitchell joined them, then you start seeing those targets kind of get dispersed out a little bit more. Uh, I, I believe A.D. Mitchell last year had about 70 
targets. Eight, uh, Xavier Worthy was right around 103. So uh, that's kind of where I see some of these guys. If Isaiah Bond is your leading wide receiver and he has 85, 90 targets, I think you're going to be happy with that. Because yeah. one, he's shown and he's proven to be the big guy that can go make those plays down the field. Two, he's also a reliable target with all of the production he's had in the past at Alabama. Uh, but three, that also means, Rod, that to your point, a number of other guys are getting looks. And right now I, I'm with you. I think you'll see that circle expand to about five in 2024. Yeah, because right now, if you're a defensive coordinator, you don't know where to start, unfortunately. Like last year was easy, right? You start with Xavier Worthy. You take him away. You know he's the number one wide receiver. That's the main target share. I think they'll start probably with Isaiah Bond potentially, rolling coverage, maybe trying to give them help on Isaiah Bond. Um, but then that will naturally lead to other guys getting one-on-ones. And Texas got a ton of guys that can win in one-on-one situations. Um, so, and, and, and that was the case too uh, in the scrimmage at times. One thing I did love about the reports coming out about the scrimmage, CJ, is that the defense did make some plays, offense made some plays. It didn't seem like it was too lopsided. We did hear good things about David Benda making some plays on defense, uh, Colin Simmons making some plays defensively. And, and one thing that we've discussed, the edges should be a strength. And I hear the edges, guys like Trey Moore, um, Colin Simmons, another guy, Baron Sorrell, another guy, actually had good performances in the scrimmage as well. You know, it's interesting because, you know, as we were talking to these guys as they were leaving campus, we really started to hear mixed reviews on who actually won the scrimmage. You know, initially mm -hmm. I heard the offense had a great day. And you start talking to some folks on the defensive side of the ball who – might have been a defensive prospect or a family member who watched the defense a little bit closely. You start hearing the defense really started to have a good day. And one recruit even told me, yeah. And then it felt like Sarkeesian kind of flipped the script and said, all right, hold on, hold on, hold on. Let's, let's, let's get this offense going a little bit. Yeah. And for whatever reason, about around midway, boom, the offense starts scoring. And then the offense really kept their foot on the necks, if you will. And they just kept going. I was told there was, Four consecutive possessions in which Arch Manning or Quinn Ewers led touchdown drives in the red zone area. The red zone as a whole, I was told, was much improved from what we saw a year ago. There was consistency. Uh, they were running the ball in. Quinn Ewers found Gunnar Helm for a touchdown in the corner. Uh, there was a, a number of uh, successful plays in that tight red area that we don't necessarily uh, recall from a year ago. And I think that's one good good for the offense Two, yeah. what does Texas need the most at the moment? It's guys in those close knit areas that can go get, you know, big stops by penetrating the offensive line. And right now I'm not sure those guys are going to be uh, really expected to be on campus at the moment. I think that's just going to have to go out and add somebody to the portal so that when you get close to the red zone, you have those guys like a Devondre Sweat or a Byron Murphy that you can go out and expect to make plays in the backfield to prevent teams from running the ball in near the goal line. Yeah, it, it, it is such a mystery why Texas was so bad in the red zone. I mean, considering the talent they had, you're going to have two receivers drafted in the first two rounds, maybe two in the first round. JT Sanders, second round third round tight end maybe uh, you'll have, I mean, your offensive line was the biggest offensive line in the big 12. Uh, Quinn Ewells will be drafted in the first round, potentially, if not worst case scenario, that guy's a second round pick as a quarterback. Uh, there was just so many you had in the backfield. Jay Brooks uh, was one of the best running backs in the country. And even after that, Jaden Blue and Cedric Baxter were pretty capable of having hundred yard games uh, in there, obviously uh, respectively to them. It's just it, it it was a mystery, and I don't think Sark he never solved it. He ne and he he's a, and boy, Sark also added to that he's a brilliant offensive mind, and he could never figure it out. Is it? And I, I'm hoping and I'm thinking it was just an outlier because it was such a multifactorial mystery that Sark could never figure out. We know he goes back into the lab to fix the liabilities on the roster, the liabilities in the system, um, whatever it may be in his philosophy, uh, the issues. He fixes those in the offseason or at least devotes a lot of attention and his resources to that. And I, I bet the entire offseason, his number one issue, his number one concern and number one emphasis for him was figuring out what happened in the red zone for them because it cost him a national title. Oh, yes. It cost him a shot at a national title and a shot at being undefeated until he would have had the only loss in that national title game. There's no doubt. 120th in the country in touchdown percentage in the red zone is just unfathomable considering all the talent they had. 
Yeah, a hundred percent. But, and we've talked about this in the past round, luckily, and we expect this to be the case again, it's already off to a good start. Texas, whenever they come off of a season in which there's a glaring issue, whether it be on the offensive side of the ball or the defensive side of the ball, there's been, you know, tangible evidence that they've been much better the year after. So whether it be something that Texas corrects, they emphasize, they go out and they approach every day in practice, summer, fall camp, whatever it's been, there's been noticeable improvements in those glaring issues. Most reasonably or recently, Texas on the defensive side, uh, third down defense. They were horrible yeah. year in 2022. They couldn't get off the field. You look at the Texas Tech game that they lost in Lubbock. What was the issue? Well, it was third downs and it was fourth downs. Tech converted seven, seven fourth downs. They stayed on the field. They extended drives. They wore out the Texas defense. And that was ultimately the issue, or one of the recipes at least, that was kind of uh, developed in terms of beating this Texas defense was, yeah, if you get them to third down, you know that you'll eventually find a way to move the chains. Whether you, it takes you to fourth down or whatever, they can't get off the field. Well, what did we saw? What did we see last year, Rod? They were the best third down team in the entire country. So I'm not saying that's going to be the case, but after one practice, one scrimmage of spring ball, we're starting to hear things are clicking a little bit better than a year ago in the red zone. That's been an emphasis. It will continue to be an emphasis. Uh, I'm excited for it because, again, if you have a kicker like Bert Auburn who's made so many field goals, it's a great luxury. But you don't want him to have a busy day. No, that's not what you want. Mm-hmm. The only busy day you want him to kick from is about 20 yards out, you know, and the 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 the, the, uh, the fight song's already been playing. The fans are already cheering, high-fiving in the stands. And in. <laughs> yeah. yeah, the cannon's already blown. You don't want him kicking before any of that. You don't want them, you know, linking arms with the fans next to him, sweating out a 45-yard kick. That's not what you want. So right now I think that's going to be – what you see moving into the fall is Texas continually uh, kind of emphasizing the work that they do in the red area. Yeah, no, you're right about that, though. The issue, the, the glaring issues they've had season to season haven't been systemic. They haven't necessarily plagued them year after year. That's why the coaching staff done a really good job there. All right, uh, we see your questions. We're about to get to those here in just a second. Uh, before we get to the questions, uh, let's give a shout out to our wonderful sponsors here for the winning drive. Really appreciate them um, because they're the reason uh, that we're here, folks. So we appreciate their support. Flat Creek Estate Wine. Now, a lot of folks were out there watching uh, the eclipse at Flat Creek Estate Winery. Uh, so I'm sure they enjoyed that. But 11 awards in 30 days, including double gold Grand Reserve and Texas Grand Reserve at the Houston Rodeo. Flat Creek Estate Winery is raking in awards and it's just a few minutes from the heart of Austin, Texas. Select bottles of the wines by Flat Creek Estate are now available at your local specs, and now you can get a taste of what they're all about. Flat Creek Estate is also a gorgeous venue hosting events for the whole family all spring long, and their winemaker's dinner is on April 11th. It is the perfect date night. There are a lot of folks out there who enjoyed the eclipse today uh, because that was a great event, and you have a chance to eat, drink, and be awesome at Flat Creek Estate. For more information, please visit flatcreekestate.com. That's flatcreekestate.com for more information. So we appreciate the uh, support of Flat Creek Estate. And like I said, a lot of people out there enjoying the the eclipse earlier uh, today. Also, uh, our wonderful sponsor uh, also is Autograph, and we appreciate them. If you're excited to be uh, working, uh, actually, we're excited to be working with Autograph, co-founded by the GOAT, Tom Brady. Yeah, that's right, the GOAT himself, Tom Brady. Autograph is where real Texas fans get unreal rewards. It's the first app to track and reward fans for loving what they love most, turning passion into access and experiences. Founded on the belief that devotion should be rewarded and the future of fandom belongs to the fans. They've been sending true fans to the biggest games in college basketball for just 16 bucks. Yep, that was $16. So if you're balling on the budget, you got to appreciate that. So as we gear up for football season, this means you can score discounted tickets to marquee matchups, scan the uh, scan to download the free autograph app in the Apple Store uh, and use the referral code on Texas. That's the referral code on Texas and see where fandom takes you. So thank you. Uh, to autograph app. All right, let's get to some of the questions here in the chat. We appreciate you guys being patient with us. Uh, Cisco uh, wants to know, Rod, uh, what made you not almost become an Aggie and stick with Texas? <laughs> um, well, that was easy 
I will say R.C. Slocum, number one. Shout out to R.C. Slocum. I uh, love me some R.C. Slocum. He's the one that that, that in he influenced me and convinced me to stay in the state because he's the one that brought it for the first time. And I didn't really think about it as a 18 year old. And I should have been. He was like, hey, do your parents go to the games? Uh, if you want your parents to go to the games, you should stay in the state. He didn't say go to any. I mean, he said just stay in the state so mom and dad can go to all the games because they want to go to the games. And I was like, damn, never thought about that. I was late in the process, and at that point, it was Texas, Texas A&M, Colorado, Florida State, and Penn State, and all of the out-of-state schools at that point were out of it. It was just a Texas, Texas A&M thing, and Mac Brown was the one that convinced me, now you don't want to go to A&M. You want to come to Texas. It was a Mac Brown, Austin, a combination of Mac Brown and Austin really was the key. I'm a city boy. So, I mean, I got family from the country, from Louisiana, but I'm from H-Town. So I felt more at home in Austin than I did out in Aggieland. And I, that actually, I think, was a big influence on me, too. And, you know, Mac Brown was, I said, Mac Brown was kind of a young, it's hard to think of it now because he's like a, I feel like a grandfatherly figure. But he was kind of a young, brash, up-and-coming guy back then. And he, he was a hell of a recruiter, man. Mac had, Mac had the mouthpiece. Mac, Mac, he, the, the line that he dropped on was, I still remember the great line as he's walking out of, uh, my garage and leaving after having a great, you know, great, it was a great visit with my mom. Mom loved him, sat on my mama's couch, drank her sweet tea, said all the right things, convinced mama. And he's walking out and he says, Rod, I can't win a national title without you. And then he just turned around and left. It was like a movie moment for me. I was like, <gasps> you need, you need to win the national title? it was, it, it is where great recruiters know what that player needs to hear. That's what That's I mean. a great line to drop at the end. It was oh, it, he. It was like he planned it. I swear, exactly. It was a mic drop, and he he didn't even say he just turned. He said that and then turned around and walked away. And I was just sitting there like, man, he needs. And I just sitting there thinking like, he needs me. I'm the one. He, I'm the missing piece for Mac Brown. And That's it really awesome. did. He blew me away with that one. That was a great. I don't know if he used probably use that line on everybody. I'm sure if I asked somebody like, oh yeah, I remember that line. Yeah, but it worked on me. It eventually worked overall, you know. <laughs> yeah, so uh, credit to Mac, you know, <laughs> he yeah. got the job done. Yeah, that was yeah, man. Mac was Mac was just a hell of. And by the way, I can't give all the credit to Mac. Tim Brewster, who was a recruiting mercenary, uh, yep. been one of the best recruiters. Got Chris Sims, recruited Sims, recruited myself. He's uh, yeah, recruited Vince Young. That dude was he was my recruiter. So that was that was also a big part of it too. I love me some Tim Brewster. The Ric Flair of recruiting, as I like to call him. All right. Uh, thank you for the the, the question there, uh, uh, Cisco. All right. Uh, Ryan Nelson wants to know, CJ, uh, Pettijan and Barnes know what they can be at UT. Yeah, I, I can imagine so. Uh, you go watch another DFW guy like Anthony Hill in person, and I think you get the understanding of what else you could become as well. Uh, that's been the case for Elijah Barnes, Riley Pettijan, who Texas is going to have to battle a number of schools right now for his commitment. Uh, both Texas has been around with for a while. Both are, are really fast guys. How about this, Rob? We've talked about the 10, nine, six for Elijah Barnes, yeah. 10, seven, seven for Riley Pettijohn's no joke either. Uh, both of them can run. Both of them can move across the field, sideline to sideline. Uh, it's not too often you see two SEC caliber middle linebackers in the state of Texas, no less running under 11 seconds in the 100 meter. Uh, that's really impressive stuff. Uh, Riley Pettijohn scheduled to come back to Texas for the spring game. That'll be interesting to see, again, just how well Texas will be able to gain momentum, fend off some foes from out of state, and also kind of maintain uh, the push that they hope to have. Because, again, he's a guy that they are wanting in this class uh, at the moment. Uh, but we talked about Elijah Barnes earlier. Texas giving him that playbook, quote-unquote, Mm -hmm. It gives you a strong indication of how they view him as a prospect uh, and also how much he reciprocates that love back to Texas. Uh, speaking of uh, linebackers, this is a good question from Kelly at Horns Up. Um, guys, do you think our linebacker position will be better this year, even with the loss of Ford? Oh, that's man. tough. Nah, yeah, yeah, you see, I'm, I'm hesitant. Um, I can't say better. I can't say better. I don't, I, I don't, I don't know if it'll be a weakness, but Jalen Ford was such, and even last year he had a down year. He was such a great resource. I mean, his football IQ was through the roof. Um, he was, he's the guy that never left the field. 
Right. Everybody else on that defense left the field a lot of times. He was a guy, CJ, that never had to leave the field. If if he was still on campus, he'd be your green dot guy. He would have the sideline helmet communication, and it would be no discussion about it. It'd be easy. Right. Um, but without him, yeah, I don't even know who the who that actually gets that green dot out there. Number one, um, but CJ, I think he will be missed. I, I do. I, I don't. I don't think you'll get um, a serious extreme regression there at at linebacker because I do think Anthony Hill's a star in the making. Um, but I do. I do think you know you need David Benda, Leonga Lafau, as you brought up. I know you're a big fan of him. You need one of those guys, or maybe it's Mo Blackwell, maybe it's someone else. To, to step up and help stabilize that linebacking position right now. Or maybe it's multiple guys. Maybe you need options. Um, so I'm concerned about it, Kelly, but yeah, I, so I can't yeah. say it's going to be better. Uh, uh, if it is better, that tells you Anthony Hill is an All-American this year. Yeah. That's kind of the one silver lining I could see if that this group is going to be better. I think it's because Anthony Hill is going to Make a massive step. Not a good step, not a great step, a massive step. That's the only way I see it right now. Listen, David Bend is fine. He's a fine linebacker. He does the little things very well. Uh, but again, there's still some limitation whenever you ask him to drop back into coverage. What did Anthony or what did Jalen Ford do so well at Texas? He diagnosed the routes in front of him, even yeah. behind him. He really made some impressive plays and timely plays, no less, when forcing turnovers to seal games. Uh that was kind of the big thing for him. Is, if you needed to play, he was in the right spot at the right, right time uh, to seal games for the Longhorns. I think that's going to be something that's very difficult to to, to replicate, to to make back up with his absence. Yep. No, I'm with you on that, too. I, yeah, I, I think you're right about that. And I think that job is going to be a little tougher just because you don't have the best defensive tackle duo in college football. I mean, that helps. It helps Good. a lot. That's a linebacker's best friend. It helps you be able to navigate, get to the football quickly. You don't have to worry about linemen all up in your grill uh, because you, you're pretty you're pretty safe because you know that those D tackles demand double teams most of the time, and they'll keep those linebackers clean. Um, that's also something that a young Anthony Hill and a sure. young and, and, and a veteran David Bender don't have the benefit of either. So they're, they're, I'm with you. I hope that's the case. I hope you're right. I hope you're right about Anthony Hill taking the leap. And he can do it, by the way. He could. It's possible. Yeah. If there's, you know, I, I know I've kind of been a little down on David Benda. I don't, I don't want to come off that way, but it, I, it's worth, you know, kind of mentioning what he's limited to. If there's one positive note and one thing that will always be the case with David Benda is that guy goes 100, 110% every play. You know, it's been highlighted after that Alabama game uh, when he was chopped down, had to do the basically a mat drill in the backfield to get to uh, uh, Jalen Milrow, also not an easy guy to sack for the big play. Very, very athletic, and I think there's some speed there that's been unlocked a little bit that we might not have seen showcased over the past couple of years for David Benda. And also the text I got from uh, a source following the uh, scrimmage this, this weekend was, David Benda just flies around everywhere. He is everywhere. So yeah. that is certainly assuring in the sense that, yeah, Anthony Hill, we know what he's good at. We know what he can potentially be. But who's going to be that guy next to him? Well, if it's David Benda, it's a guy that can move around very well. So that's yeah. something to keep in note as well. No, You're talking about getting fast everywhere, Rod. David Benda is a guy that might be a little quicker than uh, than Jalen Ford. He can run. Yeah, you're right about that. I've seen him on the field. No, it does translate. He can run a little bit. There's no doubt about that. Uh, all right, there. Good question. Um, I want to hit this question here by Anthony because I actually want to get CJ's opinion. I haven't seen Jaden Blue. You've been to the practice media availabilities. They've had multiple uh, practice windows for the media. So you've seen Jaden Blue. Uh, he wants to know what uh, – Anthony wants to know what's Blue's weight at this point. I think his weight is like one – uh, I don't know. Is it 195? What is it, CJ? Yeah, I had to look real quick. He's listed on the Texas roster at 198. I think he's going to play right around 205. I think you'll see him add a couple more pounds. If you, Listen, if you're able to play at 205, that means you've added some extra armor, as we've we've called it this offseason, between the tackles, which he's already impressed a little bit uh, this offseason when faced with going up against those interior defensive linemen and linebackers. That's kind of been – uh, something we've heard a lot about Jaden Blue this offseason. He looks thicker, he looks good, but he's maintained that quickness and speed, which is kind of his MO and moneymaker so far. Again, I, I, I mentioned it earlier, a big play that I, I was told over the weekend happened was Jaden Blue finding the end zone in which he 
had a big collision with David Benda and Derek Williams, uh, found the end zone as a result of that. That probably wasn't the case a year ago when he was right at 190 pounds. Yeah. Uh, I think that's a battle he doesn't win a year ago. But this is the continual development that we've seen with his body and the work that Tory Becton has done behind the scenes to get him ready while maintaining that speed, which makes him such a special player. That's one thing we got to start digging into as well. Depending on how these guys keep performing at the NFL Combine in Texas, you could make the argument won the NFL Combine this year. You could make that argument if you want to. Um, Corey Beckton's done a really good job of getting these guys uh, basically bigger, faster, and stronger. That's <laughs> you want to just simplify it. That's and and I would say, like I said, I know they do their own preparation for the NFL Combine, but it seems like whatever that they are doing, obviously in you know off-season drills and off-season work, that it has translated not only to their play on the field, but it translated to their performance workouts at the Combine and in drills. So I, I think we got to start giving Tory Becton a lot, a lot of credit. Um, I would, for, I would agree. Yeah, for the overall development. You see these guys transform their bodies. We're seeing a lot of that from some of these players. Uh, Baron Sorrell comes to mind uh, with guys like that. But you're talking about a guy like Jaden Blue. So, yeah, I'll give uh, Tory Becton uh, more credit than I did a year ago. I think he was kind of the, the silent guy behind the scenes. Um, I think now looking at these guys and the way that their bodies are transforming and look at the way they're performing on the field and in the drills at the combine, you start getting that over and over again. I remember when – you know, Texas had better athletes than the Aggies, but there were times when the Aggies were performing better at the combine than than Texas. I'm talking about way, way back in the day. Um, and it was it was a weird thing. And I know I'm not trying to talk about the Aggies too much, uh, even though we're going to bring them up later. Um, but I'm glad that the guys now, you know, whatever they're doing is translating more toward the performance drills that are going to get them. You know, it, they're going to get them higher up on draft boards that are increase their draft stock. It just seems like the, this group of guys, this new generation of players for Sark, his guys, his program, um, like they're going to have better performances than some of the um, some of the older guys that had at the combine specifically. Like Texas, you know, Texas never really had. They had some good freaks at the combine. They had their fair share, but I can't remember Texas overall winning the combine. No. As a, you know what I mean? as a group, as a team. It felt like that this year, though, CJ. It felt like that. Yeah, certainly. I mean, you you talk about the big winners from day one. It was Byron Murphy, you know, and then you see the overall uh, winners from the entire day or the entire weekend in Indianapolis. It was the man who set the 40-yard dash combine record. It was another guy at 6'2", running yeah. a 4-3-4. Four, four. You know, that speed is, is recognizable. And now it almost becomes synonymous with the way that Sarkeesian's built this team because when you consider who is coming up in the ranks that you could you might see at the combine a year from now, it's Jaden Blue who is in that you know conversation to being one of the fastest players on the team. Oh, and it's Isaiah Bond who Sarkeesian went out of the portal to go add to this team. Also a 10-4 guy. There's a lot of speed on this team, and it's not going to go away anytime soon because of the way Sarkeesian envisions his program being run. That's really important, and it's again, it's. The, all the combine is, if you're the University of Texas, is free marketing for your development, your strength system, and, oh, yeah, your staff for being able to get these guys into the league. That's the biggest key for a lot of these prospects. So that's that's a big takeaway that they've been able to build upon so far. Uh, no, that's good. That's a really good point. Uh, we'll get back to some of the questions here. Before we do that, uh, we do want you guys to become an on Texas football OG, an OTF OG. Uh, join us on texasfootball.com we're running a special right now all right so it's twenty dollars off an annual subscription to the site if you use the promo code otfog all right so otfog for twenty dollars off instead of a sixty dollar a year um it's just 39.95 or you can get a monthly subscription for just 5.95 for more insider news on the team and recruiting, make sure you check out on texasfootball.com and become an OG member. That's right. So uh, OTF OG to get $20 off. Just use that code OTF OG. There you go. Uh, to, I, I like that. Uh, OTF OG. Uh, I see a lot of y'all out there. I, 
y'all, I would classify y'all already as OTFOGs. Yep. Uh, so go actually make it official, official. All right. Uh, one more uh, question here. Then I do want to get to uh, the Tafunji sweat news a little bit, and then we'll come back to some of the questions. And then we may wrap things up with the, the Aggie discussion because I don't want to take up too much time talking about the Aggies. I know it aggravates people. Um, but a- a- AJJ underscore sports um, has this question, has this comment. I think it's a really good one. We were talking about the target share earlier of the wide receivers and how it may be more diverse than it's been in a long time because of uh, the uh, embarrassment of riches, sarcastic wide receiver. Uh, AJJ underscore sports says, whoever Quinn makes as his safety blanket, quote unquote safety blanket, will get the most targets. Interesting, the safety blanket. Um, and I remember when I, you you had this, CJ, because I know you were talking about it, when, when Quinn was asked to describe each of the wide receivers uh, and – and something unique about them and their skill set. And um, in terms of safety blanket, he did have an interesting comment about Matthew Golden, did he not? No, he did. He had very soft hands, which if you're a guy looking for a safety blanket or someone that's very reliable, I think that's a great, uh, you know, kind of way to describe him. Matthew Golden too. I would go to Rod if I was Quinn Ewers. He's not that blazing guy. He's not going to be the guy that beats you down the field with his speed, though he does have some of that in him. You know, he's a 10-9 guy. He's not necessarily uh, an Isaiah Bond at 10-4 or Ryan Wingo at 10-5. Uh, it, it, it's one of those things where if you look back at the target share a year ago, who would you say Texas relied on as a safety blanket? Was it a split of Jatavian Sanders and maybe a Jordan Whittington at times? I feel like JT. I feel like JT was safety blanket guy. You're right. If I, if it, based on my eye test and watching film, when Quinn was in some, he was in some ish. I feel like he looked for JT, but I could be off. Yeah, it, I, I'd agree with you. I thought JT at times was his guy. I thought Jordan Whittington had a number of big catches mm-hmm. on like those third and seven, mm-hmm. third and eight regions when teams are really looking around. All right, where's AD Mitchell? Oh, where's number one? We got to hone in on where those big guys are. It was kind of Jordan Whittington out of the slot who made some plays, whether it be on whip routes, curl routes, kind of finding that soft spot of the zone that I was really impressed with a year ago. He was that guy who, again, because of some of the dinged up injuries that he's had in the past, not the biggest explosive guy, but a guy that because of his experience and how good of an athlete he was, Quinn Ewers could say, yeah, we need eight. We'll go get nine with Jay, with Jay Witt. Yep. Right now, I kind of see Matthew Golden falling into that same role right now, which is interesting. Again, we've talked about this, the, the target share and how much that gets dispersed. Well, a year ago, Xavier Worthy had 103 targets. A.D. Mitchell had 70. Uh, JT Sanders, who battled some some injuries, some nicks and in, in cuts uh, a year ago, ended up with 50. So if that's your target share at 50, what does that mean for that fourth option? Well, jo- Jordan Whittington ended up with 46. So I'm thinking if you're Matthew Golden, 50 reception or 50 targets, 50 to 60 is probably a great range for you because we've talked about all these wide receivers so far. But we've yet to see how a guy like Silas Bolden's going to fit into the group as well. A guy who had, you know, 50 plus catches a year ago. Yeah. That's a guy who's expecting a lot in this offense, not to be a gadget guy or a guy to come in on special downs with special plays made up for him. Uh, word to sketch there. But uh, I do think uh, Silas Bolden's going to be a big part of this group. What kind of target share does he get? Mm hmm. I mean, that's a big that's a big question mark right now. But I think that safety blanket that you can count on right now, way out from the start of the season, is going to be Matthew Golden. Yeah, I got a lot of bonds uh, in the mentions in the chat uh, about the safety blanket, but also a couple of Matthew Goldens as well. Just fair, but uh, uh, Rod, would you consider was Xavier Worthy ever the no. safety blanket? I, no, the, no, I'm with you. He was the, he was the number one wide receiver, but I think that's different than the safety blanket. Yeah, I, I'm with you. I, a hundred percent. I'm with you, hundred percent. I would love to see, I don't know if Pro Football Focus does it, and I know you uh, do a lot of deep dive analytical stuff. You did one on the wide receivers that was excellent earlier this year, so maybe you came across it. Uh, I would like to see targets on third down or targets on third and five plus yards to gain, you know what I mean? And see, you know, know, targets under pressure uh, to see who Quinn actually did look at when the fit hit the shan. That would, you know what, I'm going to try to see if I can find it. Because to me, that said, that says more about safety blanket there. Like, all right, I got to have it. I got to have it down, money down situation. Or, 
oh man, I'm in it. I, I, I'm just looking for a way out. I literally just need a safety valve. And that's the one you look for. UT boy, I came here to chew bubble gum and talk Jante and I'm all out of bubble gum. What's well, that there? <laughs> we have not had a Jante Cook update. Uh, I will say that it, he did come up uh, of the names of guys who made plays, made big plays in the scrimmage. Um, so we have not talked about that, but you're right. We've been talking about the wide receivers. I say Jante Cook, he is, um, there's no doubt about it. I will admit it. We, he's underrated right now. I don't know how it happened because we've been obsessed with the new, the novelty of all the, the great, uh, acquisitions via the transfer pull at wide receiver. Just talked Matthew Golden. You were talking about Silas Bolden, Isaiah Bond, and I'm not gonna lie, we've I'm not gonna say disrespected Jonte Cook, but we definitely haven't given him enough potential uh props and praise because he could end up being the number one guy, he could yeah. end up being the safety valve, and yeah. we didn't we don't mention him really for either because he's. <laughs> Got more familiarity with the system. He 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 and Quinn have chemistry already. He's all things the other guys they're playing catch up with. He's got chemistry. He he doesn't have to get acclimated to the campus and to class because he's already done that. I mean, he's on the fast track. And Sark likes him, by the way. You got to be in the circle of trust, and Sark likes you. You got to be, you know, in that circle of trust. But he's on the fast track to being a wide receiver one or a safety valve. And I feel like we don't give him props, CJ. I'm ready to admit that. I'm ready to admit that, UT boy. I'm ready to no, admit. I, I am too. And I agree with you. You know, it does kind of feel like he's fallen to the wayside, which is bizarre because he's still running with that first unit. He's <laughs> still, you know, in that top three group that we've seen be trotted out at practice so far this spring. So it's a little bizarre. But I, I think more so to the credit of a guy like Isaiah Bond, Golden, and Wingo, you know, we've heard a lot about them. And, and right now, I don't want to discredit Jonte Cook because he's a tremendous player. He's a borderline five-star prospect coming in for a reason. But, I, I, again, a, a week ago I challenged him almost. I, I want to see him more. I want to see those big flashy plays that we hear from from an Isaiah Bond or a Wingo out of practice. That, to me, is going to be what gets Jonte Cook on the field uh, a lot this upcoming year in which I would say we expect a whole lot about him in 2024. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm with you, UT boy. Well, I apologize for the disrespect, man. Jante, I got to get on that Jante Cook bandwagon. I, I, I will. I'll start singing his praises, but you're right. I want him to start snatching the headlines, CJ. Start snatching the headlines. That's like what, yeah, snatch, I, I want to hear it because yeah. he's got it in him. We yeah. saw it a year ago. Yep. All the guys at the Combine – were extremely complimentary of him. I mean, they all essentially implied he's going to be the number one guy. Yeah. When you listen to them talk at the combine about John Tay Cook. So um, we'll see. This is a first world problem. Great problem to have. Uh, okay. Uh, I, I, great question here um, from Jose, um, Jose Rodriguez. And this is for you, CJ. It's a recruiting question. And I think it's a good one. He says, uh, CJ, is the recruiting strategy that Sark uses more effective than other schools? Um, he waits for commitments to come on late in the process so that UT isn't haunted all year like LSU with DK Moore. Yeah, I, I think it works out. I think it's one of those things where I think the, the staff really values momentum in recruiting. You know, the last couple of years, you know, dating back to the 2022 cycle, we've really seen, you know, a strong run of commitments around the 4th of July time, you know, uh, that, that kind of month back in that 2022 class, we saw Cole Hudson, we saw Connor Robertson. Uh, we saw Texas end up back with Kelvin Banks later on in the year, but as a result of that strong run in the summer, you really get that hype. You get to see, yeah, Hey, these guys all understand why Texas is, uh, or why, why they want to go to Texas. They see the vision. And then the season pops up and you see those incremental steps that they've taken on the field every single season. And you're like, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Now I see why Texas is so, uh, you know, kind of perceived to be the school to beat for a lot of these guys. And so uh, while you have these guys in the class early, that's great. You know, you'd love to see uh, a Brandon Brown in the class, Lance Jackson. But as a result of that, yeah, now it's 10 months, 12 months of fending off other schools and worrying about, do I need to go after another kid? Do I need to get another kid on offer? Do I uh, on campus? Do I need to extend another offer? 
that's a lot for this Texas staff who we've seen over the past as well. When the season comes around, they kind of put recruiting to the wayside. Yeah, we did all of our work over the summer. We've mm-hmm. got a job to do now, and it's coaching, it's to win, it's to get championships to return to Austin. So I love the way that they approach things. Knock it out with the last weekend in June. Kind of go into that July quiet time as, yeah, I got a lot of my top prospects on campus. We were the last school that they saw. We like where we sit now. And then when the season comes around and these kids want to commit, that's it. And I, I, I think that should be the, the uh, you know, the, the approach. I, I, and I think they've done very well. Look back at, yeah, Ryan Nelson commented here. 2023 summer was incredible. Remember that run that Texas went on? I think it was 13 commits in about 30 days. And it was oh, yeah. Arch Manning committing on June 16th. The sarc yeah. after dark stuff. <laughs> I mean, it, it was just one after another. You never knew. I, Texas landed – yeah. Four commits on a single Sunday afternoon. How did I know? Because I was at the racetrack watching the ponies <laughs> run around, and I was sitting there missing every race, typing up commitments on my phone. You know, it was it was a crazy time. But at that same point, that's how they they like to do that. And so it's mm-hmm. uh it's worked in the past, and I think that's going to be the blueprint for them moving forward. It's weird because Charlie Strong used to wait kind of to the midnight hour of recruiting and and have big splashes late with kind of a lull leading up to that. And obviously Sark is way more effective at it uh, these days than, than than Charlie was. But it's interesting, yeah, the, the approach to it. I, I agree with you, by the way, too. It's It seems easier than um, getting the guys on board early and then having to handcuff them through, you know, yeah. eight, nine Rod, months. You- time <laughs> you talk about getting in relationships and seeing how well your ex yeah. does afterward but you know when you first get in the relationship that honeymoon period lasts quite a while you know there's no issues there you just tied the knot per se if you yeah. are able to do that so far into the cycle already that honeymoon fades knocks out two months you probably have to fight other guys off for so it does your job for you holding off that special moment for everybody by committing later on Hey, UT boy, got something for you, CJ. Say, <laughs> CJ, I told you when you joined us, watch the Jonte talk. No slander you know, tolerated. <laughs> no slander here. I told you, I'm a huge Jonte fan. I, he's one of the top prospects I've ever covered at the wide receiver spot. I, I just want to see more. I want to hear more. And I think he's got it in him. Yeah. Um, no, he's got in, in that room. It is a heated competition. Kind of gets us to what. And thank you very much, UT boy. You are you family, babe. We appreciate that. La familia. Uh, uh, Christian Villanueva here. And this is interesting. With all the wingo talk, does he start as a freshman? I don't think he starts as a freshman, but I will go this far. I think in terms of just physical gifts and tools, the combination of physical gifts and tools, I don't know if there's a more talented wide receiver on campus right now in terms of all the physical gifts and tools and the combination of them, the size, the, uh, the speed, the acceleration, the, uh, the twitchiness, uh, the, you know, the, the, the wingspan, all of these different things. So when all of that comes together with the refined route running and the football IQ and the familiarity with the system and the chemistry with, the quarterback, whoever they may be, Arch, probably. Um, that's when I think you're going to see a guy that could potentially be drafted in the first round. He's got that kind of ceiling. Like I said, I think it's the best combination of, of traits for a wide receiver since Roy Williams was on campus. Yeah, so that's I, what we got. I'm yeah. with you. I think at the end of the day, he'll probably be the wide receiver on campus right now with the highest NFL ceiling. Uh, I remember hearing, you know, players, coaches at the the pro day looking at scouts saying, yeah, you all need to keep a close eye on this kid over here. So that that's certainly interesting as well. But does he start day one? Yeah, that's tough, especially when you have a group of guys who already has a lot of experience across the board, Golden, Bolden, Bond, and now Cook in that mix. Does he start? Is he your first guy off the bus uh, or out off the sideline onto the lineup? I don't know. That's tough. They'll have to really, really surprise some folks. But Sarkeesian's not been shy to give those freshmen an opportunity. Calvin Banks, uh, Cole Hudson, uh, I mean, Derek Williams got here in the summer and started immediately. So we'll, we'll see how the, the rest of the spring and the summer months go. 
All right. Uh, we'll get back to some of the questions here in a second. First, I want to get to uh, thanking our wonderful sponsors. We appreciate their support so much. And uh, the first of those wonderful sponsors is our friends over at Flat Creek Estate Winery. There are a lot of folks who actually enjoyed the eclipse today out at Flat Creek Estate Winery. 11 awards in 30 days, including double gold Grand Reserve and Texas Grand Reserve at the Houston Rodeo. Flat Creek Estate Winery is raking in the awards and it's just a few minutes away from the heart of Austin, Texas. Select bottles of the wines for Flat Creek Estate are now available at your local specs, and now you can get a taste of what they're all about. Flat Creek is also a gorgeous venue hosting events for the entire family all spring long. And their winemaker's dinner on April 11th is the perfect date night, uh, so you can eat, drink, and be awesome at Flat Creek Estates. For more information, please visit our friends over at Flat Creek Estate at flatcreekestate.com. That's flatcreekestate.com for more uh, information about how you can host, uh, how you can uh, go there to host a lot of wonderful events, um, or you can go there for a nice date night at Flat Creek Estate. So we appreciate all of their uh, support. Also, our friends over at Autograph, uh, we appreciate their support. All right, everybody, we are right in the thick, uh, getting ready to play the national title game tonight, actually in the men's uh, tournament and spring football, of course, is here and we're all excited. So let's be real. How many hours do you spend watching, reading, and listening to our coverage, which we appreciate? appreciate of the Longhorns and think about that for a second and then ask yourself, what if there was a way to get rewarded for doing it? I mean, there are hundreds of credit cards and airline points programs, but what if there was one where you got points for showing your Texas fandom? Well, now you have that opportunity. Now let's take it a step further. What if those points you earned for being a fan unlock rewards like $16 tickets to the biggest games on the schedule? Yes, only $16. Scan to download the free autograph app in the Apple App Store and use the referral code on Texas. That's a referral code on Texas to see where your fandom takes you with the autograph app. We appreciate their support as well. All right. Before I know we are getting close to the end of this thing, so we'll get to uh, some of your questions, uh, if we haven't gotten to them, we appreciate all those. So keep them firing. Uh, we uh, will also get to, uh, I want to get to a little bit about the Andre Sweat news, just a couple of tweets about it. Um, and we'll kind of wrap things up with that. But Paul Feinbaum, um, he was doing an interview and uh, he was talking about the Texas, Texas A&M rivalry uh, and talking about Texas, obviously now making their way to the SEC. And if you will, Matthew, would you pull this up for us, please? Uh, just quickly, let's hear from Paul Feinbaum. This riled up a couple of Longhorn fans. I want to get uh, CJ's thoughts about Paul Feinbaum's comments about the Texas, Texas and them robbery. Here it is. Surprised. Uh, uh, because they they felt uh, that they had been promised that A&M would never come in. And... They were promised, and uh, Texas would never come in. But things change. Yeah, and 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 it's A and M's fault. You're supposed to ask why. Oh yeah, why? Why? Yeah, yeah I was, I was thinking that. <laughs> One, two, three. Uh, <laughs> the A and M was so successful in the SEC, cousin Shane, that uh, Texas said we want some of that. I mean, it really. Yeah. It, it, I mean, they Texas in 2010 was heading to the Pac-12. I mean, they had already commandeered uh, a bunch of schools because they wanted to be more aligned with the Pac-12 academics, uh, the Stanfords, mm -hmm. the Cals, yeah. right. <laughs> what's now in the ACC. <laughs> uh, and they finally realized we, we need to do something. And Texas could have gone to the Big Ten, ACC. I mean, all this nonsense that we heard from, oh, well, the SEC. The SEC didn't do anything but answer a phone call uh, from yeah. their their attorneys answered a phone call the same phone call that uh, that everybody else got. Uh, they were they were on the prowl. They were leaving it, and they were going to go somewhere. I, I think most of that may be accurate. Uh, I I don't know necessarily that they went because the Aggies had so much success. I will say the Aggies got a hell of a bump going into the SEC. I even even when the Aggies win, I predicted at the time they'd win double digit games. So the Aggies got a lot of talent. They got Texas talent. Um, and the same thing when Texas goes into the SEC, they got legit talent. Um, what the Aggies did was that they they really did. They took their profile, the profile of their athletic department, the profile of their program. It it went into a different stratosphere, um, and it did allow them briefly to get from underneath the shadow of Texas. 
which is what they want it to be. They didn't want to be, some people call it little brother syndrome. I call it the side chick syndrome. They didn't want to be the side chick um, because Oklahoma had become Texas's main rival and a did not want to be the side chick. And that's what that rival had become. I played in that rivalry. I can tell you right now, Oklahoma was the main rival. All right. It was not the Aggies. The Aggies know that. And nobody wants to be the side chick rival. Nobody wants to be the side piece. Nobody. You want to be you want to have a, a main rival and you like to be out kicking your coverage when it comes to that rival, too, which is why the Aggies like Texas. And they want to be a rival with LSU. And that's not really working out for them either. Um, but they got a rivalry with Texas again and they did not. They wanted to be out from underneath the shadow of Texas. And now the shadow has pretty much found them again. And I'll admit this. I think the Aggies made the right decision to go to the SEC way before Texas saw it. I think they saw that it was a a it was a much better step for the overall uh, future and profile of their program before Texas saw that the SEC was a basically is beneficial for them as well, just as beneficial, if not more than it was for the Aggies. I think the Longhorns were looking to the Pac-12, whatever the hell it was, maybe even looking at the ACC. No, the SEC is where they needed to go because the SEC has got the best leadership. I think that's what Texas figured out late in the game was that, no, no, with all the uncertainty and all the change in college sports, we need, we need to be with great leadership, and the Big 12 don't have it. Now, that was prior to them getting their, their newest commissioner, which I like Brett Yarmark, but prior to Brett Yarmark, the, the Big 12 did not have good leadership. And Texas, I think, decided they were not going to let the future of their sports programs and their athletic department be determined by the ineptitude or the dysfunction of the leadership of the Big 12. And the SEC is where you go. And yes, they make more money in the SEC too. Yeah. So it's, ha it's half right. I don't know if it's entirely true. But that's sure. where I was going to go with it, Rod, is, you know, you hear successful, you think wins, losses, championships. Yes. But from where a &M was at the time before they joined the SEC, in terms of brand valuation and just kind of getting it, their name out there a little bit more, I would say in that aspect, yeah. You know, yeah. they've put big play, uh, big time players in the NFL, you know, uh, a Von Miller, a Mike Evans, uh, you know, Miles Garrett, you know, arguably one of the best players in the NFL to, on the defensive side of the ball. That's all been great. You know, they've certainly helped build their brand and they've done that by, you know, kind of adopting that SEC logo as their own in a sense. Uh, that's been the personality. That's been uh, the persona of how they've kind of exuded their mantra or whatever to the world of college football. That's fine. That's fine. But when you start throwing around, yeah, Texas joined them because of how successful they were. Uh, what? They've been 52 and 45 in the SEC since joining. They've made the top 10 in a given season eight times. I'll give them credit for that. But they've fallen off. They've not, they, they finished ranked four times in 12 years. So, yeah, I mean, there's been high moments. You won a Heisman your first year. You lit the world on fire with Johnny Manziel. You didn't really parlay that into anything of note. There's no hardware. You, you, you got rings for yourself for a seven overtime victory. Is that, <laughs> you know, that, that, is that the ultimate saving grace of joining the SEC as a, a, a regular season win against LSU? Because that ultimately is what it is. You know, they had a great 2020 uh, season. They went nine and one. But again, you didn't win any hardware. There's no championships. You didn't bring back the SEC title. You've not played for the SEC title. So if success is what's defined right now for A&M in the SEC, then I can't wait to see the adjective that's used for Texas whenever they come in, guns a blazing, coming off of a year in which they won their conference championship. They played for uh, the college football playoff. And, oh, yeah, now they have what appears to be as talented a team that they've had in a decade and a half on mm -hmm. campus currently. That'll be interesting because I think the levels in which you define success for A&M and Texas are completely different. They're not in the same stratosphere. No, totally agree with that. Um, and I and and I'll I'll say this too, and I think you will agree. Um, well, I hope you'll agree. We'll see. Maybe a good debate. That also something Texas realized a little bit later was how much it meant for young prospects to play in the SEC. And yes. maybe that was also underrated, right? That because I've heard that you've done interviews with guys here on, on Texas football, and we've interviewed guys, and literally it it mattered to them. It was something that they considered in their recruitment. Like, no, no, I want to play in the SEC. And I'll admit when I was coming up, I don't 
conference didn't matter to me as much as school mattered to me. It didn't. And now there, there's no question it is being considered because I've heard too many elite recruits that you guys mm-hmm. have you bring up. No, no, the SEC, it matters. Yeah. And you know why that was the case? It wasn't because of AM. You know, yes. they might have contributed <laughs> a little bit, but the yeah. archetype for that was Nick Saban, you know, creating that Alabama dynasty, which then allowed LSU to have some high moments. Florida always kind of stuck around a little bit. And now Kirby Smart, the new age dynasty that everybody's kind of looking at as gold standard in the SEC, they've all won championships. You know, mm-hmm. they've always been the team for my lifetime, starting in around, you know, 2007, 2008, when uh, Tebow was running the show there, that parlayed Alabama's dynasty. Yeah. That, you know, kind of kicked that thing off a little bit to what we saw with LSU and the late teams, Georgia now. That's never been a and AM's never been that team that teams your folks can look around the country and say, yeah, 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 that they're leading the SEC. No, that's never been the case. They've always yeah. been the mascot on the Alabama shoulders being carried by uh, Alabama, basically. So uh, that's been interesting to me yeah. and to see yeah, that kind I, of being portrayed. I, I agree with you. I agree with you. I, they, they, can't, they, they can't take credit for it, but I will say they did acknowledge that it would give them a bump. That it it did. They they acknowledged that it would matter to recruits before Texas did. Texas was a little too, I don't know if they were a little too uppity. Maybe Texas was a little too, you know, elitist in their view of things that no, 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 we're Texas. We actually transcend all that conference up. People will just get the and they did for the most part, but something happened, and you're right, it was it was during that SEC run. The Tebow to Nick Saban, that dominance where the SEC brand actually did help influence recruits more and more when it didn't matter back in my day. So I, you're right. The, the Aggies, they can't take credit for it, but they damn sure used it. As yeah, a, no, they, it benefited them. Yeah, it yeah, did. And it will smart. benefit Texas as well. Yeah, exactly. That's, about- that's why they mad. They're like, damn it, now they're going to get the SEC bomb. It's like, yeah, yeah. they didn't even need it. What was, what was the one thing A&M had over Texas and Texas's worst decade of football in my lifetime. Well, it was they had the SEC patch. Now that the playing field's even in Texas, kind of figured some some ish out. Yeah, what's what do they got? No, I agree. And I'm not an I'm not an Aggie hater. Aggies out there who are listening, I'm not an Aggie. I was almost an Aggie, so I'm not an Aggie hater. Uh, but I do like to keep it real, even when it goes wrong. Uh, Ryan Nelson had this uh, I think question. I think it's pretty good to wrap up our Aggie conversation here. Ryan B and CJ rank the importance of these four games for next year. Michigan, Georgia, Oklahoma, Texas A&M. Mm-hmm. Oh, that is good. That's good. The importance, huh? Importance. Yeah, that's exactly. The importance. Key the word. Uh, Similarly important. to success, Rod, that, I mean, that could be construed so many different ways. Right now, if I had to – man, that's tough. If yeah, but, I had to put uh, them in order right now mm. – Cause then I'm thinking about you. Cause you want to get, you can get back to the SEC title game. Cause I'm looking at it from that perspective. If you want to get to the SEC title game, then you know the the games like obviously matter more. The SEC games matter more. Yep. Then, so I know I, this game is big. That's a big game, though. It's a big I'm gonna game. I'm gonna work from behind a little bit. I think Michigan is last, and I say that because. Oh, Again, it's a non-conference game. It's week yeah. two. Your team can still evolve. There's not a lot coming back for Michigan. Yeah, the stakes are going to be high. They're the reigning national championships, but it's a completely different team, Agreed. completely different looking program. There's no pre-existing emotions that will come into that game. They didn't beat you by one point the year before. I think that game's last. a and is going to be third to me, and it's this is tough because, again, it's a and It's the first game back for that rivalry. It's also year one under Mike Elko in which Texas could go in, put a stomping on a and in Kyle Field and really kind of start the new era of this rivalry with a bang. But I don't know right now if that game will have as much implications on either side as you'll see earlier with the Georgia and in Oklahoma. Uh, Georgia to me is the most important game still. It, it is. It gets that nod over for over Oklahoma because I think right now Texas is expecting to be in that conversation to being a top five, top ten team at the lowest. They're mm-hmm. expecting to make it back to the college football playoff. That game against Georgia not only is a, 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 a little measuring stick of an idea for you, but it also gives you the opportunity if you're Steve Sarkeesian to say, oh, yeah, you know, we've beat Alabama and Georgia in back-to-back years. Oh, and we're also going to be back in the playoff. There's 
that gives you that leg up over in Oklahoma who you can get revenge on, but at any given moment, regardless of how these teams kind of face up in a year, you ne- you never know how that goes. That Georgia game, that'll be the most watched game of the season. Yeah, no, it's a good question because we get a lot of different uh, rankings here. A lot of teams, uh, a lot of get, people have, you know, Oklahoma is still number one, uh, Georgia number one. I'll go with Georgia number one, the ultimate, you know, barometer, the measuring stick, right? Georgia still bringing back a lot of talent. It's Georgia. Kirby Smart is considered probably the best coach in college football right now. And that is a hell, and it's going to be at home. That so that is a big game. So I'm I'm with CJ on that one. I'll flip though your CJ, your two and three. I'll go with number two with the Aggies. I think it's big, man. The rekindling of the ride for the first time probably since Bob Stoops and Mac Brown when they first took it over. Because remember in 1998, the Aggies had won the Big 12. And that's his last conference title they won. Um, and I came in in '99. That at in '99, I would say the it's crazy to think it, but in '99, the Texas A&M game is probably bigger than the Texas OU game yep. at that point. It is just me thinking about because the Aggies are 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 hotter and just want, just me coming in, and then Bob Stoops comes in, and and Bob Stoops at '99 and at Texas, I think that's the first year him and Mac Brown face off, and then in 2000 they win a national title, and then that rivalry turns into a different monster. Even because the pressure was on Mac, you could you cannot you cannot believe the pressure that was on Mac when Bob Stoops wins the national title at Oklahoma in the second his second year. Ooh, I, we felt it. We felt Mac the pressure, the boost. They, every everything changed, and Mac Brown was killing it. He had a Heisman Trophy winner, was beating Nebraska, winning nine games. I mean, he was feeling. He was like, Mac Brown's like, I'm doing really good here in Texas. No, you're not. No, you're not at all. Nope, you're not at all. So. That's the last time I remember the AM game being bigger than Oklahoma. And since then, it's been bigger. I think this year, AM's bigger than Oklahoma for the first time since then. And it won't be that way at, you know, forever. I think it'll probably switch back after next year. But this year, I think that's the case. So I'll go Georgia first, then um, AM, then Oklahoma, then Michigan. I'm with you. If you're out of the, that, the, I can still win the SEC if I lose to Michigan. So I'm, I'm cool with that. And yeah. that's why the game is. It's a good measuring stick, but it's later on in the season. Um, yeah. All right. Uh, UT boy says a and is getting taken out behind the woodshed. <laughs> hey, UT boy, I hope that is the case because uh, the Aggies, they're going to be hyped for that one, man. It's going to be crazy. That's going to be wild. CJ, you going to that game. I bet you're going. Aren't you going? I'll be there. I know you're going. I already know. You're a young man, man. You can deal with it. I ain't been, Last time I was in Aggie land, we beat him. And that was the last. That was the last time we played them. And I was hugging some random woman on the sideline after Justin Tucker kicked the game. When it, I don't even remember who she was. We just embraced because everybody was so damn happy, and then everybody ran on the field. So that's the last time I was there. Um, I don't know if I'm ready to go back to Aggie Land, uh, but CJ's gonna represent for us. I know we'll, we'll see. Be there. We'll be there. We'll no be doubt. There. Uh, all right. Uh, well, here's the only thing on the Tibonte Sweat thing, and then we can uh, we'll end this uh, version of the winning drive. Uh, my man, uh, my man, Dane Brugler threw this out there um, that according to a team source, and we know that Fundre Sweat was arrested for a DWI. At least that was the charge. And then um, he was later uh, released. And he, uh, Dane Brugler tweeted out, Sweat has been up front with NFL teams about his partying as an underclassman and made it a point to uh, a, a point of emphasis, excuse me, in interviews uh, that it was all in his past. Obviously, today's incident uh, won't help answer any concerns with teams. I'll say this. I, I think he was a early round, early second round pick, and now he's going to be a middle to a late second round pick. I don't think he drops out of the second round as a result of this. And I do think there are a lot of teams actually, unfortunately, that are celebrating this because he's just going to drop exactly to where they want him potentially in the draft. So uh, it's a it was a bad decision by Tavondre Sweat. I'm sure he learned, he learned from it. Uh, nobody was hurt, thank God. Uh, but, yeah, I mean, he's going to pay the price for it because – I'm sure somebody's going to show him his agent how much money that he's going to lose as a result of dropping however slots, how many ever slots he drops in the draft. But to much so I think he's going to end up being a hell of a player at the NFL level. Um, if he stays focused, I don't think he's had, he has anything to worry about. It's just unfortunate that it happened three weeks before the draft. For yeah, him. 100%. That's exactly – it's just – you never want to see it, but you never want to see it before you experience the highest moment of your life. You know? Exactly. That's that's really unfortunate, and I'm sure this is a, a wake up call for T Sweat. 
yeah, maybe it's the wake-up call you needed right before he went to the league. It might be the perfect time for the wake-up call, man, instead of getting it in the league um, and then potentially, you know, a, a team thinking about you know, cutting you or something like that. Maybe it's good that they wake up call right now. All right. So uh, that's the, uh, I think the last of it. Uh, we want to, uh, I want to say that I appreciate all of the folks out there. We appreciate all the folks out there participating with your chats and your questions. Thank you very much. One more reminder, uh, by the way. Yes, we, we missed coach today. Coach was, he had, a, he had a conflict that he had to get to family thing, but coach is all right. Everything's fine. Um, but coach will be back with us uh, coming up on Thursday. Remember the winning drive will be back on Thursday. 4.15 to around 5.30. Let me remind everybody just one more time, we want you guys to become an OTFOG. Join us over at ontexasfootball.com. They're running a special right now. It's $20 off an annual subscription to the site. If you use the code OTFOG, that's OTFOG for $20 off. Instead of $60 a year, it's just $39.95. If you're a ball on the budget, like me, you appreciate that. Or you can get a monthly subscription for just five ninety five. For more insider news on the team and recruiting, make sure you check out on texasfootball.com and become an OG. Use the uh, promo code OTFOG. Uh, we appreciate that. Uh, CJ, any last words for the people before we wrap things up? No, we'll have a lot of good content over on ontexasfootball.com. Of course, uh, talking balls out as well. So go give that a look uh, right after this too. Uh, but hey, Rod, I hope your eyes are are, are working just as, as well tomorrow as they were today. So uh, a happy Eclipse Day to everybody who celebrated. Pretty cool deal down here in Austin. Uh, glad we got to check that out before hopping on and, and talking with all y'all. Did not wear any glasses, but I never looked up. It was overcast anyway. Never looked up one time. So I'm good. I'm fine. And wifey never looked up. I kept telling her, don't look up at all. We'll be okay. So there you go. We're, I appreciate the concern. And yeah, happy Eclipse Day to everybody out there. Thank you guys for joining us. Thanks to Matthew behind the scenes. He always does a great job. He's the real MVP of this thing. Absolutely. Thank you, CJ, for all of your info, man. You are great. You're such a great addition to the On Texas Football family. Uh, can't say that enough. Also, uh want to thank our um, our sponsors, Flat Creek Estate Winery. Uh, they're fantastic. Also want to thank Autograph, uh, the Autograph app as well. Uh, go check out those. All right, folks. Until next time, remember, Thursday. We'll be back for the winning drive. Coach will be back with us then, 4.15 till 5.30. Until then, until next time, hook them.